Guys, Mr. Bowman here. We're looking at 2.7 calculus methods, and in this video, we're going to focus on all the excellence questions from that 2018 exam. Um, let's jump straight into question number 19. Um, use calculus to find the values for x and when that particular function is increasing. So the first thing to note, when a function is increasing, we know that f dash x is a positive number. Oh gosh, not having a good day spelling. There we go, positive number. Um, the other way to do that is f dash x will be greater than zero. So because we're dealing with functions of the gradient f dash x, we are going to need to differentiate the function that we've been given. So let's jot that down. So f dash x is equal to 2 thirds of x cubed plus 9 over 2 x squared minus 5 over x minus 18. Um, let's differentiate that. So that's going to become 2 thirds times 3 times x squared plus 9 over 2 times 2, oh gosh, sorry, times 2 times x minus 5. And luckily the fractions and the multiplications all end up cancelling each other out. Um, so that leaves 2x squared plus 9x minus 5. We are curious when 0 is less than the gradient function that we've got. And just to note, it is a bit of a headache. Quadratic inequations are quite difficult to solve, and you can't really do it properly. So at this stage here, what we need to do is we need to draw a graph to visually check, well, when is it above 0, when is it below 0? And part of that graph is the x-intercepts. And that'll basically decide what our answers are. So what we need to do is we are going to convert that to an equation. So 2x squared plus 9x minus 5. We're now going to solve for the values of x to get to the um, x-intercepts. So we know a is equal to 2, b is equal to 5, and then c is equal to negative 5. Um, and that gives our equations or our x values. x1 is positive 1 half and x2 is equal to negative 5. So that there gives us the x-intercepts. So let's draw a pretty rough sketch of the parabola that we're looking at. We know it's a positive parabola because of the positive 2x squared, and we know the two x-intercepts. Um, so we've got our parabola. So let's say negative 5 is over here, and then negative oh, positive 1 half is over here. Um, there's a positive parabola. Um, a very poorly drawn one, but there is one. Um, and we're wanting to know, well, when is it above zero? And it will be above zero kind of in this area and in this area. So that first area is when x is less than negative 5. And that second area is when x is larger than positive 1 half. So we can make our claim. So if x will be increasing when x is less than negative 5 or when it is greater than positive 1 half. So pretty easy excellence question if you understand the quadratics part of it. Um, a really good one to practice because it does come up fairly frequently. We are now looking at question number 20 and first thing to note, looking at question 20, it's very, very intimidating. Once you get into the question, it was actually fairly straightforward. Um, so we've got a rectangle which measures 8 by 10, and we can see 8 centimetres here, 10 centimetres along there, and there is a parallelogram drawn in the middle. Um, suppose that the distance from each corner to the vertex is x, and what it means by that is you can see um, the corner of the square to the corner of the vertex noted as x. We've been asked to use calculus to find the smallest possible area, justify that we have a minimum. So the first thing to note is we're looking at the area of this parallelogram, so we need to come up with some kind of expression in terms of x for that area. So area is going to be equal to, um, just putting it in words, so it's going to be equal to the rectangle minus those four triangles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the big area, and then I'm going to chop out the four corners 
leaving us with the area of the parallelogram in the middle. So the area of the rectangle is pretty easy. That's 8 times 10, which is 80. But the area of the triangles are a bit more annoying. So if this here is x, because the whole length, the width, is 10, this side here is going to be 10 minus x. Um, same over here, 10 minus x. And we can do a similar approach for the other sides where it's 8. This is x, which means this here is 8 minus x. And then same up here, 8 minus x. So what we've got is we've got two triangles that are x by 8 minus x. And we've got two triangles which are x by 10 minus x. So we're going to go minus two lots of one half of x times 8 minus x. So don't forget that's one half of base times height, and we've got two of those triangles. And we're going to do the same for the triangles with the 10 over there. We're going to go minus 2 times one half of x times 10 minus x. So we've got a pretty unsimplified expression. We now need to start simplifying. So the first thing to note is the um, the 2 and the 1 half cancel each other out. Same over here. Meaning we can just expand the brackets here. And do note that there is negative x and then negative x as well. So don't forget about that. So we've got 80 minus 8x plus x squared minus 10x plus x squared. We've got our 2x squared. So that's going to become 2x squared. 2x squared, then we've got minus 18x, and then we've got plus 80. This is when we now link to the calculus part of it, so we haven't really done any calculus yet. So we're looking at the minimum, and we know at the minimum, a dash will be equal to 0. So that will have a gradient of 0, which means we need to have a gradient function. So we're going to differentiate our area equation. So we know that a dash is going to be equal to 4x minus 18. And we know that a dash is equal to 0 at the minimum. So 0 is going to be equal to 4x minus 18. Um, so 18 will be equal to 4x. Um, divide 4 by, by both sides, which means x will be equal to 4.5. So that means the corners here, they will be 4.5 meters long. So 4.5 centimeters long when the shape has the smallest, or when the parallelogram has the smallest possible area. So that there is centimeters. So we've got the, the smallest possible, or the dimension that'll help us get it. We now need to figure out or justify that it's a minimum. And when it's a minimum, a dash dash will be a positive number. So let's get into a dash dash. So a dash dash will be equal to four. And Therefore, a dash dash is greater than zero, which makes it a minimum. So we've done a whole lot of maths. Unfortunately, from time to time, people do stop at this particular point, but we haven't actually answered the question. We've been asked to find the smallest possible area. So what we're going to do is we're going to substitute the 4.5 that we calculated into the area equation to actually find out what that is. So the area when x is equal to 4.5, that's going to be equal to 2 times 4.5 squared minus 18 times 4.5 plus 80. I wouldn't worry about doing this by hand. I'll just plug that straight into the calculator to save time. It'll also minimize the risk of doing silly math errors. That'll get you to 39.5 centimeters squared, centimeters being the unit and squared because we're dealing with the area. So we are now looking at question number 21. Um, Adam is operating his drone. It is moving in a straight line um, and t seconds after the tree has passed. Um, there's the acceleration formula. Um, we've been given some information about the velocity. Um, so after two seconds, so that's t is equal to two. We know that the velocity is equal to 20. Um, how far was the drone past the tree when the velocity was 20? Uh, meters per second. So the key thing is, it's how far, which means we're dealing with displacement, so we need to come up with a displacement equation. So we're going to jot down our acceleration, so that's 6 minus 2, or 12t, and just a reminder, 
Displacement goes to velocity by differentiating, velocity goes to acceleration. If you're wanting to go backwards, we need to double integrate to get to that. But let's get into the velocity equation. So velocity in terms of t is going to be 6t minus 12 divided by 1 plus 1, t 1 plus 1 plus c, and that becomes 6t minus 6t squared plus c. The plus c is the annoying part for this particular question, but luckily we've been given some information about velocity. We're going to substitute velocity as 20 and t equals 2 to find that constant. So 20 is going to be equal to 6 times 2 minus 6 times 2 squared plus c. Um, so that's going to be 20 is equal to 12 minus 2 times 2 is 4 times 6 is negative 24 plus c. Negative 12 plus c is equal to 20. c is going to be equal to 32, which means our velocity equation, velocity in terms of time, is going to be 6t minus 6t squared plus 32. So a bit of a headache so far. We've now got velocity. As I said before, we need to go to integrate yet again to find that displacement equation. So the displacement in terms of time is going to be equal to 6 divided by 1 plus 1 t 1 plus 1 minus 6 divided by 2 plus 1 t 2 plus 1. And then I'm just going to move down plus 32t plus c. Let's simplify all of that. Um, 6 divided by 2 is 3, so that's going to be 3t squared. Um, 6 divided by 3 over there is 2 minus 2t cubed plus 32t plus c. This step here, a lot of us panic, oh geez, how do I find c? Um, and we haven't really been given any information about the vol about the displacement at a particular point. In this, these types of kinematics questions, we know that when zero time has passed, there has been no movement. And that's because you can't travel anything if you haven't, you know, no time has passed. Like that movement comes with the time. So if you, if you, if no time has passed, you're exactly where you are right now. So that means... Both of those equal to zero. We're going to substitute that in to find out c. So zero is going to be equal to three times zero squared minus two times zero cubed plus 32 times zero plus c. c is equal to zero. And that comes up quite a bit for those displacement questions. So displacement in terms of time is going to be 3t squared minus 2t cubed plus 32t plus c. Oh gosh, sorry, plus c. Don't forget, c is zero, so we can get rid of that. So we've now got a displacement equation, and we can now link it back to the actual question. So we need to find out how far was the drone from the tree when the velocity was 20 seconds. Annoyingly, velocity has no part of this equation, but velocity at 20 was the same as the information above. So we know when the velocity was 20, that was two seconds, so t is going to be equal to two. So we're going to substitute that in. So the, the displacement after two seconds is three times two squared minus two times two cubed plus 32 times two. Um, two squared is four times three is 12. Um, two cubed is eight times two is 16. And then 32 times two is 64. Um, we finished that all up. Our final answer is going to be 60 meters. So that means after two seconds or at a velocity of 20 meters per second, we're going to be 60 meters away from that fixed point. We are now on to question number 22. Um, we've got the function x cubed minus 6x squared plus kx minus 5, and we know it has a turning point at 3. So just a reminder, turning point means y dash or the gradient will be equal to 0 at that point. Use calculus to find the coordinates of both of the turning points, um, determine the nature of each, and justify your answer. So quite a bit of work to do for this question, um, but we have information about the gradient, so we're going to need a gradient function. So let's start by jotting down the original function, um, and then we're going to differentiate that. So y dash will be 3x squared minus 12x, okay? 
Um, as I said before, the turning point y dash is equal to zero. So we're going to substitute that in, and we also know that that happened at when x was equal to three. So zero is going to be three times three squared minus 12 times three plus k. Um, three cubed is 27, so that's going to be 27 minus 36 plus k, which means k will be equal to 9. We can then substitute that back into both the gradient function and the original function to find out their full equations. So y is now equal to x cubed minus 6x squared plus 9x minus 5, and the gradient function will be equal to uh, 3x squared minus 12x plus from that so it is a cubic which means we're expecting two turning points and we've only got the information of one so we need to find the x value for the other turning point so we know that y dash is equal to zero which means zero so substituting that into our gradient function will be equal to 3x squared minus 12x plus 9 I can see they've all got a 3 in common, so that's 3x squared minus 4x plus 3. So, or oh, factorizing that, 3, that's going to be x minus 3, x minus 1, which means our turning points, x1 will be at positive 3, and that's the one we were given above, and x2 will be equal to negative 1. So now that we've got the x values, um, we have been asked specifically to find the coordinates. We're going to need a y value as well. So let's find the y values by substituting them both um, into there. So when we're dealing with x1, y will be equal to 3 cubed minus 6, 3 squared plus 9 times 3 minus 5. I'll be looking to put that straight into the calculator. I wouldn't be messing around and making silly math errors by mistake. That gets me to negative 5, and same with the second x value, y is going to be equal to 1 cubed minus 6 times 1 squared plus 9 times 1 minus, oh geez, that's, that's a very bad minus sign, plus, sorry, minus 5. Um, again, I would whip that into the calculator. We're getting an answer of negative 1. So we've got our two coordinates now. And just going to put them over here. So we've got one common negative one. That's one of our turning points. And we've got um, three common negative five, I think it is. Yep, three common negative five. The next step is determining the nature. Are these minimums or maximums? And I always use the second derivative test um, to do this. Um, so just carrying on up here, I know that y dash dash. So if I differentiate y dash, that's going to be equal to 6x minus 12. Um, so I'm going to use that just to check um, what each of them are. So y dash dash is going to be equal to 6x minus 12. That's going to be 6 times 1 minus 12, which is equal to negative 6. Um, as y dash dash is negative, we have a maximum at this particular point. I'm then going to do the same for the next coordinate. One's a maximum, so this is probably going to be the minimum. Um, but let's double check. Y dash dash will be equal to 6 times 3 minus the 12. That there is 18 minus 12, which is positive 6. So Y dash dash is positive here, which makes it the minimum. Oh gosh, not having a good day with the spelling still. There we go, minimum. We are now looking at question number 23, and we've got a tangent of this particular function, and the annoying part is the k in the function um, at a certain point has a gradient of 7. Um, find the intersects of the graph um, again at negative 34. Use calculus to find the coordinates of that point p. Um, so the first thing I know is this information, 6 or negative 6, 64. Um, that intersects the graph, so that's an exact coordinate of this original function. So if we have an x and a y, we can find out what k is equal to. So let's write down the original function. y is equal to negative one-third of x cubed plus kx plus 4. Here I know that x is equal to negative 6 and that y is equal to 64. I'm going to substitute those both in. So 64 is equal to negative one-third times negative 6 cubed plus k times negative 6 plus 4. 
So I've got a bit of simplifying to do here. It's going to be 64 equals negative 1 third times 216, and that's going to be negative 216 minus 6k plus 4. I'm now going to do the um, 216 times 1 third, and it's a negative divided by negative, that's going to become positive. So 64 equals 72 minus 6k plus 4. Um, let's simplify that. That's going to become 76 minus 6k equals 64. We're then going to go minus 64 minus 64. So 6k is equal to 12, which means k is equal to 2. It tells us when we put k back in, the original equation is 1 third of x cubed plus 2x plus 4. So I've substituted the k in for the 2. And we are to about or talking about gradients so that means we're going to need a gradient function so I'm now going to differentiate that so 1 negative 1 third times 3 is negative 1 so that's a negative x squared plus 2 and we know the gradient is equal to negative 7 so y dash will be equal to negative 7 I'm going to substitute that in as well negative 7 is equal to negative x squared plus 2 um, just simplifying that that becomes negative 2 negative 2 negative 9 is equal to negative x squared x squared is equal to 9, x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 9, x1 is equal to 3, x2 is equal to negative 3. The, the issue with these questions is we don't know which one's the right answer because we're talking about a single tangent, but we've got two answers. Um, so this doesn't really make sense. So what we need to do is we need to figure out, well, which one of these is going to be the false answer? So let's deal with x1 first. Um, and for both of these, we're going to need to form the equation y equals mx plus c. Um, we know that the gradient is negative 7, and we know the x value. So if we have the y value, we can find out what the c is. We can then check that line actually goes through the point that we're told. If it does, it's the right answer. If it doesn't, we've got our false answers. Save a bit of time. What I've done is I've substituted both of those into our original function to find the corresponding y values. And we know that when it's 3, y is equal to 1. And when it's negative 3, y is equal to negative 7. I substitute this information along with the gradient in there just to check. Um, so for our first one, we know that m is equal to negative 7. We know that x was equal to 3. And we know that y is equal to 1. So we've got 1 is going to be equal to 3x plus, oh gosh, sorry, um, so it's going to be negative 7 times 3 plus c, um, that's going to become negative 21 plus c is equal to 1, c. So c will be equal to positive 22. So that means our equation is y is equal to negative 7x plus 22. We know that x is equal to negative 6 at the point. We're going to substitute that in. So x equals negative 6, and we're checking if 64 comes up. So y is going to be negative 7 times negative 6 plus 22. That there is 42 plus 22. That there is 64. So because 64 came up, that means we've confirmed the exact point. So that means x2 has to be a false answer. If we did the same process, we would have calculated that y was not 64 if we did the same thing for the y value. So what that means is the coordinates of this particular point will be the coordinates of the tangent, and that was when x was equal to 3. Therefore, point p is 3, comma 1. So that wraps up the excellence questions from the 2018 calculus exam. Hopefully you found it useful. Let's keep practicing.